Kia ora, my name is Sarah Jane Riley. Not Ashamed is all about equipping you and me as disciples of Jesus Christ. In God's word in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. It's my privilege to extend the invitation to you to journey with us in God's Word. Over the coming weeks, Pastor Ben Martin, myself and Pastor Jesse Hereford will will team up with an amazing group of people as they delve into God's Word, as they ask key questions and they speak to what it means for their lives. We encourage you to join us on this journey. Don't be mere participants, but engage with us open the word of god bring out pen and paper whatever it is so that you too can be trained and equipped for god's word well hi there everyone i would like to welcome you today to our very first not ashamed Bible discovery program. This is a panel discussion where we're going to be looking at Bible passages, digging in deep, applying it to life, and seeing what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. I'm so glad that you are here with us today. Welcome. The verse that this is based off, our key thought, our key motivating verse for this series is based off 2 Timothy 3.15, which goes like this. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And today, that's what we're hoping to do. We're hoping to dig into God's word, rightly handle it, and take something away that we can use in our everyday lives. Thankfully, I am not here alone to do this. My name is Ben, and I will be the host for today. But I am joined here by some friends, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves to you right now. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean. I work at CAS and I'm really excited to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Younes Masi and I'm the church pastor for Garden City Fellowship and Ashburton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hi, guys. I'm Vicky and I also work at, at CAS alongside of Sean. Um, and yeah, I come to you from Ahoka in Canterbury. Well, Sean, Eunice, Vicky, I'm so glad to have the three of you here with me today. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of our panel today. And I'm really excited to, uh, to hear from you as we dig into the word and how it speaks to you. Now, if you are watching here um, today with us, we need you to grab a couple of things. Maybe you're not all together ready for this. So all I need for you to get is a pen, uh, some paper and your Bible. Now, what version of the Bible? Whatever version you read from every day. We were just talking a few minutes before we've gone live to record this for you. And each of us is reading out of some very different versions. Um, NIV, ESV, um, NLT, that's fine. Whatever you've got, uh, NKJV, KJV, you just grab whatever you have. Go grab that. Come back here now and join us where we're going to dig into the word together. Uh, Our key passage today, in fact, is going to be Job 26, verses 1 to 14 to start. Um, But before we open up the word and dig into it today, just love to uh, pray. And uh, Vicky, if if I could ask you to pray for us today, ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Thank you so much. Mm, Sure thing. Let's, Let's bow our heads. Lord, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we have your word and that we can spend this time delving deeper and just lingering that little bit longer in your word. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit. I pray that your spirit would give us all understanding, would give us all a nudge of how we can apply these to our own lives. But more than that, Lord, please um, enlighten us on how we can share this with others. So Lord, may you be among us. Thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So grab your Bibles if you've got them now, and we're going to be turning to the book of Job in the Old Testament, Job chapter 26. And the way in which we're going to be doing this today, it's the discovery Bible reading method, which has us go through the scriptures a couple of times, then try to put it into our own words. And then we're asking five very specific questions about this and i'll give you those questions now so there's going to be no doubt about where we're heading today and the questions are these Uh, what is new as we've gone through the passage today uh what surprises you 
uh, what don't you understand? What will you apl apply or obey? And finally, what will you share with someone else this week? Those are the questions we're gonna be seeking to answer as a panel today. And I believe, Sean, you are going to take us through Job 26, 1 to 14 today to start with. So I'll hand it over to you now. Sure. Then Job answered and said, how you have helped him who has no power, how you have saved the arm that has no strength, how you have counseled him who has no wisdom and plentifully declared sound knowledge, with whose help have you uttered words and whose breath has come out from you. The dead tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God. Sheol is naked before God and Abaddon has no covering. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not split open under them. He covers the face of the full moon and spreads over it his cloud. He has inscribed a circle of the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he shattered Rahab. By his wind, the, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? Thank you, Sean. All right, so e even as that is just um, uh, going through your mind, we're just gonna hit it up right again. So Vicky, I think if you're gonna take that for us again now, take us through those verses, thank you. Sure thing. So I'm reading from uh, New Living Translation. Fantastic. Then Job spoke again. How have you helped the powerless? How you have saved the weak? How you have enlightened my stupidity? What wise advice you have offered? Where have you gotten all these wise sayings? Whose spirit speaks through you? The dead tremble. Those who live beneath the waters. The underworld is naked in God's presence. The place of destruction is uncovered. God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps the rain in his thick clouds and the clouds don't burst with the weight. He covers the face of the moon, shrouding it with his clouds. He created the horizon when he separated the waters. He set the boundary between day and night. The foundations of heaven tremble. They shudder at his rebuke. By his power, the sea grew calm. By his skill, he crushed the great sea monster. His spirit made the heavens beautiful and his power pierced the gliding serpent. These are just the beginning of all that he does, merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his power? Thanks, Vicky. So Eunice, you're going to attempt to, if you were to put this passage into your own words, if you were going to sort of, if someone said, hey, what's Job 26 all about? How would you, how would you describe it? Well, the first thing that I see here, uh, Ben, is that actually Job is responding to Bildad. And uh, it's good to actually see what is in the context, but we don't have really time to dig deeper into the context of this passage. However, when we look at the way Job is responding, he, he seems to be telling to Bildad that, Bildad, I do know God. Because Bildad was sort of telling Job that, you know, it seems like you really don't know how God works. But Job is responding to him and telling him that I do know how he works. And then actually Job goes ahead and he tells Bildad that I know God is awesome. He is a creator he's mighty wonderful summation of, of of what these verses are so look let's let's attack some of these questions today so as we've read job 26 um, 1 through 14 that first question or well, what is new to you today and i'm just going to open it up right now so first in go for it <laughs> what's what's jumped out of you what is new as you've read these verses today you know one of the things that really stands out for me is verse 13 it says by his breath the skies became fair his hand pierced the gliding serpent this was something new for me like it says by um, by his breath the skies became fair 
fear. What does that mean? Like skies became fear. Is it like he he's just blowing his breath, and then you see that all the skies cleared out? This is something new for me, to be honest. I knew that God says it, it says in the Bible that everything came into existence through His Word, but He says by His breath, the skies became fear. Yeah, this is something new for me. Now, one thing that I um, hadn't really noticed before, and I'm not sure if I've even noticed it a lot in Scripture, but uh, I'm actually looking at verse 14, that this chapter talks about God's power. And like, like you said, Eunice, how you know, it could be just a breath and we have the universe present, right? We've got all this power described, and yet in verse 14 it says, these are just the beginning of all he does, merely a whisper of his power. And it's like, wow, that's, that's like God's power times infinity. <laughs> it's, it's, um, and I'm not sure if I've ever seen that kind of in scripture, that it's talked about the power of God, and then it says, but this is just a, a taste of, of what the limit of God's power. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, as opposed to it being sort of God's power on full display, which is what we might think we're seeing. Job mm -hmm. flips and says, no, no, this is the... God, God's barely even got going here. You, 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 you ain't seen nothing, you might say. Yeah, 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 that's right. The terminology that Job is using is really interesting. It's quite fresh and new to me. Like, look at verse 5. He's saying, the dead, the dead are indeed anguished, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. Death is naked before God. Destruction lies uncovered. Like, nothing is hidden from him even death is he knows everything about death and uh, destruction lies uncovered he spreads out the northern skies or empty space the whole language actually you look at it, it's quite obviously quite deep stuff here to be honest mm. I guess I guess it aligns with what the whole chapter is you know God God's majesty is unsearchable you know yeah. and um uh, Sean, what's as you've just been looking at it? What what just jumped out at you? What's new? What what did you go? Whoa, never never noticed that before. Um, I would say verse seven, where it says he stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. Mm. I'm not sure what it has in your um, your translations, but that's that stands out to me because I remember growing up and hearing of um, of a lot of theories on creation. I mean, um, I read one place. And I remember hearing this, there is a Hindu writing where they believe that the earth is actually supported on the backs of mythical beasts, or in their case, on the backs of elephants. Um, so just reading this, and I think that was confirmed. Okay, I might have done a little study on this, but three, uh, 3,500 years later, this was confirmed by Isaac um, Newton, that the world is suspended in space and that it's held up by gravity. So I think 3,500 years before they confirmed this, I think it was already set out in Job. So I find that really, yeah, just really stunning. It, it is amazing to think that Job had, Job had never been to space. He was never a part of any Apollo missions uh, that, that would have confirmed a, a detail like that, huh? Yeah. It, it, it's, the description is almost so perfect, isn't it, of what it actually is? Yeah. And look, for you at home who are right now um, watching this, as we've just reflected on what's new to you, we've now been going for about sort of 15 minutes and, you know, we all know that the mind, so stand up, shake it off and just have a think. What is it that has been new to you in this passage so far? What jumped out to you as you've read these verses? Take a moment, think it through uh, and write it down on that paper because as we're moving through the scriptures, it's not enough that we just read it. It needs to speak to us. The Bible promises us that it will the holy spirit is promised to to be our teacher and our guide and we but we want to claim that promise today we don't want to leave until god has spoken a word to us today so what was it that was new for you today well as you're thinking about that i'm gonna the, you have to guys have to sit because we're you know we're filming right now so you have to shake it off just as you sit so you can just do a little wiggle but um we'll go into that next question what was the surprising thing um and maybe we'll go in the reverse order. Sean, did you want to start us off? Did, was there something that surprised you about this passage today? Yeah, I think what really surprised me was that 
I don't know, there's just so much proof, like it points to the sovereignty of God. It just you know, like it shows his creative power. And I think a lot of um, scientific studies have supported this. So when I read this from a biblical point of view, like with those lenses, with that worldview, I don't know, like how can you miss the majesty of God, you know? So that's what, um, yeah, that's what really hits me. It's just, you read this and you think, how can you not think that there is a God? How do you explain the, you know, the order that is around us and everything, how we function, just the specific details of creation? How do you miss it? So that's, yeah, that's what's on my mind. You're saying this passage really pushes you into that idea yeah. of like, that God made it all. Absolutely. Um, and how did the world hang itself in space all on its own? Yeah. Yeah. What a great reflection. And I think going along those lines, we said about order. Um, in, in my Bible, I've got an asterisk beside the words great sea monster. I think your version, Shan, said Rahab. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it says in, in my Bible, the, the little footnote says, Hebrew Rahab, the name of a mythical sea monster that represents chaos in ancient mm -hmm. literature. And when you talk about order, um, you know, the whole idea of God as our creator and creating everything is he just destroys chaos. He is a God of order. And the sea grew calm. He destroys, he destroys everything that people had been learning about in the ancient literature about, about chaos. Um, he says, no, I, I create order. I create systems. I create things that um, are totally in order. And he is a God of order. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I suppose that's another thing <laughs> new for me that I didn't actually um, know that that great sea monster Rahab, yeah, represented chaos. Yeah, in verse ten, actually, just just in support of that, Vicky, when you read verse ten, it says he marks on the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. How can you put boundary between light and darkness? And mm -hmm. Like, it's, look at this Bible verse. It's just, it's just telling the power that God has separating things. Like he separated light and darkness. He separated water and the dry land. And he has set the boundary between them. and They cannot cross each other. And obviously some people must be saying, so how about the tsunamis and how about other things that, that sometimes actually water does cross its boundary. And whenever it does, there is so much harm and uh, many lives are lost as well. But we'll go into that question some other time. However, what this passage is telling is that God set the boundaries. God is awesome with mighty power and he has done all of that with that power. And there's no way that that could have all come to be by chance. Mm. Yeah, of course not. Mm. I agree. Mm. And, 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 you, and you really get a sense of it, don't you, that, uh, that Job is, that, that's, that's what he's trying to get over to his friend. Um, he's really trying to get that, this big idea of God. He's trying to, you know, just expand it and, and make it so massive. Um, I, I, no one has picked up on it, so I thought I might just comment. It's because it's very interesting. Those first few verses of 26, um, does everyone, did everyone see the sarcasm in there? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Job is being so sarcastic, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. The reason is because it seems like Bildad is trying to tell Job that you don't know God. Bildad was saying that, you know, you can't be righteous. There is no one who can be righteous. You deserve the punishment. That's why you're suffering. And Bildad was trying to portray to Job that I know God. I know how he works. And then Job goes back to him and says, well, Bildad, I also know God. I know what you're talking about. I know him. And he says it in a, in a way that is a bit sarcastic. <laughs> there is a bit of sarcasm there. And uh, as you move on, and then in the first few ones, few verses actually you see, Job is actually saying, uh, he's actually talking to Bildad. And then later on, he moves to explaining who God is and how he created everything. So you picked it right, Ben, like first few verses actually seems like, because he had three friends, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, right? 
And it seems that all of them are sitting around and Bildad is talking and Job is talking directly, looking at him and talking to him. And then saying a few things and then Job, it looks like he looks into Hamlet and he begins explaining that I know who this guy is, what you're talking about. So yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Vicky, Sean, did you have any uh, anything to comment about that or uh, sh should we move on to the next question? Have, have you guys got any, anything more there? Maybe just um, add on to what Pastor Yuna said. I think um, in light of when we see like suffering or when, when we're experiencing trials in our life, I think maybe perhaps our picture of God is clearer in those times than in when, you know, than when we're in prosperity and when things are going well for us. So, so I think it, like for me, I take it as a lesson. If I'm probably going through a trial in my, um, um, in my life, just to recall to my mind the majesty of God and just to keep preaching that and just to get my mind in order, you know, that my God is sovereign and that he's a God of order and that he ordains things to come to pass. And it is, it is always for my good and for his glory. So I think that's, mm -hmm. sorry, I just went off on a tangent there, but thank you, Pastor Eunice, for sharing that. It's beautiful. What you have said is awesome. I loved it. We allow tangents here. That's all right, Sean. We don't mind a tangent every now and then. <laughs> no, it's and, and and for you who are who are watching at home now, this is a great opportunity. Um, and just bouncing off what Sean has said because she's made a really great point. Job was in a going through a hard time, and I think a lot, many people, us included, the times that we're going through right now have been challenging. And as you come to these verses here in Job twenty six. What, what, what of these things that Job has said do you find particularly comforting um, at a time where things do seem out of control, where the world seems um, like there's not much that we can do about anything and, and circumstances are spinning and we feel like we're at their mercy um, and we're asking ourselves, what have we done wrong? You know, this is what Job's friends were trying to assert, that he had brought this on himself. And sometimes when things are not going right in our life, the first thing we assume is, is that, well, we deserve this because we, we've, we've made a mistake too. But Job says, not necessarily. Maybe you're trying to put God into a box and you're trying to put me into a box. You think you can package it all up. In fact, I want to unpackage it and show you that maybe all of this is far greater than you've ever dreamed or thought. Maybe God is doing more than what we imagined. And so as you look at these verses here, and as we wrestling with our own situations right now, what do you find yeah, particularly comforting here in these verses? What is speaking to you today? Jot it down, write that down. And what, what surprising comfort do you find here in Job's reply to his friend who thought he had him figured out? Mm. Mm. Well, hey, you know, it's sometimes when we come to scriptures, though, and, and all of us probably can admit this, you know, here we are sitting on a panel and uh, we know we're being watched by others. And when we're asked a question, the, the initial reaction is, well, I better have a good answer. <laughs> but I love that in the um, Bible discovery reading, there's a great question in this that I think is really important because all of us, when we come to scripture, don't always immediately understand or recognize what it is we're reading. And so I'm going to ask that uncomfortable question today and see what you've all got to say. Um, and that question is this, what don't you understand about Job 26 today? What are you looking at and just going, it's no better. I'm just not seeing it. I'm just not, it's not clicking for me today. And um, we've, we've sort of, we started with Eunice and we've started with Sean. So Vicky, I'm going to go down the middle. <laughs> And is there something that as we've gone, just look, if you need a minute, I'll give you a minute. But um, or you can always, you know, you can always defer um, or, or phone a friend and your friends are Sean and Eunice. But um, if, uh, if, as you look at these verses, what here have you sort of, as we were reading, sort of you said to your mind said, ooh, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what that actually is saying. Um, I, I kind of assumed that the gliding serpent is Satan. Would that be, would that be, is that what you guys would think? His power pierced the gliding serpent. In, Satan? Well, in the Bible, it talks like serpent is usually like dragon, serpent, Satan. The language, you, language is usually used for Satan or devil. Mm. I, I do kind of wonder why um, that verse 13, it, 
talks about you know making the heavens beautiful and then it just pops this line and and his power pierced the gliding serpent it's just interesting that those two were put together and just before that actually in verse 12 is talking about rahab mm. have two pieces you know in the surface like uh, if you read this first you may end up thinking he's talking about rahab yeah. the lady that is mentioned yeah. That, that's not what it is. It's 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 really like I don't really understand everything about this. There are some views, theologians they give, but it's a strange word. I sometimes use my little um, and I think some of you have already referred to this. I have a study Bible, um, and I have sort of down the side my um my sort of notes that connect to what I'm reading. And yeah, I I was just looking um what it was connecting me to and it was a, a verse somewhere in Isaiah and uses the same same words about this fling serpent that's attacking. So yeah, the, the imagery is certainly um, there, though you do see sometimes it's not always a direct um, imagery to Satan. It's sort of a, it can be more to the cunning or to the deceptiveness or it can be to an attribute as opposed to the, to the full blown um, personality. But yeah, but certainly worth um, questioning, Vicky. Yeah, great question of the text. Would it also be fair to say that in the Bible, we've got, um, there's a lot of great principles in it, but the Bible doesn't just have um, stories of things that we should do. If we've read our Bibles, many of us know there's plenty of stories of things that people did that we shouldn't do. And I've once heard it said that Job, in some senses, is a book of bad theology because God at the end of the book comes <laughs> and rebukes um, Job's friends and even Job to a point for much of what they have said and here we find ourselves in the midst of this so it's yeah. always important to recognize that in the in the greater whole of what we're reading what we're reading might not necessarily be totally what we should do given that God we know if we kept reading this book we'll turn up at some point and go hey guys no <laughs> yes yes absolutely absolutely I agree with you Oh, that's very kind of you, Yunus. Thank you. And to be honest, Ben, <laughs> one thing quite comforting for me is uh, I was looking at one passage. Uh, if you were to actually, uh, like, application-wise, something that is comforting to me is that, you know, he covers in verse 9, it says, he covers the face of the full moon and spreading his clothes over it. Mm. It's, again, it's, it's showing how wide and big God is, like my problems aren't bigger than him. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at in verse seven, he spreads out the northern skies or empty space. He covers the empty space and then he suspends the earth over nothing. Think about it, earth is hanging in, in this space there's no rope, no nothing there. And then he's like having those uh, skies, they are like spread over empty space. It's not that something's supporting them. It's over the empty space. Mm -hmm. What I see is that God can, um, I mean, if you think about it from an application point of view, what comforts me personally, is that God is able to cover my empty spaces in life as well with his love, with his care, with his uh, compassion, mm -hmm. that he is there to cover and fill that emptiness because he has done that when you look around us and he can do it for me individually as well. So this, this is so comforting for me, to be honest. Yeah, oh, thank you, Eunice. Mm -hmm. Sean, I wanted to give you an opportunity as well. Is there something that, that as you read this, hasn't totally made sense? No, I think Vicky and Eunice, they covered it pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you guys actually did. And in fact, the yeah. thought I had as, you, as Eunice was just sharing, and Eunice has already jumped to our next question. I love that. Eunice, you preempted it because we're going to go and apply this now. And that was a beautiful application. Well, um, I mean, Dane, I won't... Uh, comment on that question <laughs> oh no no you have to go again no sorry you, go, you jump so you have to go twice now 
but what I actually, the thought that came to mind and you sort of generated that thought is, you know how you were saying in verse 14, um, the Bible says, you know, God's power, uh, who can understand it? Mm. I was thinking about that question. What don't you understand? Job 26, in a sense, is meant to help us understand that we don't fully understand God and how his, his greatness and how he does things, as, as, as you rightly said, how he makes the, the pla how our planet hang there in space. How does he do that? It's what Job is saying, you might not, we'll never necessarily understand that. And that's part of who God is. But in the Bible and so many other places just highlights this point, doesn't it? That um, his ways are, are bigger than ours. So mm -hmm. in a sense, I find that an interesting question. Perhaps that was meant to be asked in what don't we get? that Job 26 has, that's, that's the point it wants to leave us with. You will never fully grasp in your finiteness how huge God is. Yeah. So for those of you who are watching, what is it that you have not, that you're not getting about this? What is it? What reality of God is, as, as we've just highlighted now, is, is too big for your mind, what 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 thought has has these verses about God's creative power and His greatness? What has it spoken to you? Jot that down today, and just and and once again, we know that the time is ticking, the clock is ticking, and uh, we've only got a few more minutes now. But um, we want to give your mind a moment just to to refocus, refresh. We we understand the human condition. We've all got finite attention spans, but we're going to move on to our final section now. And thank you for sticking with us today, Eunice. As I said, preempted it, and Eunice, you don't have to go twice. That was you spot on what you said. Um, but I'll just open the floor to whoever would like to share. How do you think you're going to apply these verses today? As we've gone through them, what what's what's the application point for us and for you? Do you think? Um, well, I I totally agree with your point, Eunice. That um, oh. Yeah. Who can underestimate what God can do? His power is limitless. And that applies to um, things that go on in my own life or your own life. Um, I know I keep coming back to that great sea monster, <laughs> the chaos and the calm. And I like that metaphor, that fact that um, God has the power. He, he has the power and the skill to calm my soul and to calm my inner chaos. I'm thinking of the inner chaos. And, and then if you sandwich that with verse 14, with that is just merely a whisper of his power, what, what great things he is able to actually do with our lives. Um, and he just calls us to trust him that he will do these things. And that if he can hang our earth in nothing, um, praise God that he is interested in me and you, that um, he is interested and uh, his power is limitless. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Mm. Beautiful application, Ricky. Yeah. Mm. One way that, um, that I would apply, well, the, the text would apply to my life is that recently, uh, so one thing that I'm really into is apologetics. So there's the defense of the Christian faith. And I really, that's just something that I'm really passionate about. And I'm sure I've mentioned this to um, a few people already, but I remember having a conversation recently with one of our friends who was a retired pastor. And I remember having all these facts. I had all these facts sorted. And then he asked me the why question. He says, well, why do you think that's important? And, and it just totally stumped me. I had absolutely no response. So what that made me think is that when I come to the text, and I will think that I have all the answers and I'm so confident and then I share it. And then when someone asks me, why is, you know, how is that important to my life? One illustration that I will use is that the French philosopher Voltaire, he says that if a miracle were to occur in the marketplaces of Paris and it was witnessed by 2000 men, I would rather the, um, not believe my own eyes than to take their testimony. So it just shows that facts alone, irrespective of how well they're uh, presented, um, we'll never bring anyone to Christ. So I think that's just something that really, really, um, that I'm wrestling right now um, when I come to the text or when I read something that's challenging and then I have, I suddenly have um, all this confidence to go out and share it and just to um, spit out all these facts. But really, if 
if I am not able to share Christ, if I don't really believe that um, it is him who gives the growth and we can only do so much with our um, human strength mm -hmm. and our little minds, then I don't think that anything else would matter. So I think to stick to the heart of um, the gospel, I think this points to the gospel is that Jesus saves in him alone. Mm. Ah, thank you, Sean. Be beautiful application. Thank you. Eunice, did you want to go for round two? I, I'm sure you've got a second application hiding um, up one of those shirt sleeves. Yeah, it's just uh, I, during, during our discussion, actually, Ben, you commented that, you know, many of us, we are going through tough times. And, you know, even though we are staying at uh, home or we stayed at home, now we are under alert level two. But the truth is there are so many people and even I have experienced that on a number of occasions. This, like, you begin to ask questions, you begin to find meaning and purpose. So, so why do you exist? What is this all about? You know, just like this tiny thing has basically paused the whole world, everything, right? But then when you come to this passage, you can see how mighty God is. And I want to focus on that. Yeah, there are so many challenges that you, sometimes, you know, when you begin to think about that, you, you feel disheartened and you feel empty and hopeless. In fact, I was just the other day reading one story from uh, about a guy in, in, in South Auckland who took his life because his business basically went into liquidation. And that can happen to many people. However, the reason why it happens is because when we begin to think that there is no more life for me, there is no one, no one there or, or, or there to help me. But when I see this passage, I see that God is mighty man. He can help me. I can turn to him. He he's hanging the un, universe up in the sky, and he he's got this whole planet Earth is just running around, moving around. There's nothing like you can see that is moving it. But of course, we know that that's God. So honestly, yeah, I had a second application to that, to be honest, just for, for our times that, that, you know, no matter how, how bad I'm feeling, no matter how hopeless I'm feeling, no matter how, how like anxious I am, I can count on him. He's there for me and he will cover me with his hands. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful picture for me. I want to hang on to that picture and not do this uh, coronavirus thing. Yeah. Well, that bounces really to our last question for today, and that is this. And we've only got a couple of minutes, so we'll have to be brief as we answer this. But in a sense, Eunice, I almost feel like what you've shared could be the answer to this question, is that is, what would you share, what will you share with someone else that you've pulled from this text this week? And that feels like the kind of thing that we could share with somebody else at the moment in the middle of this. Um, but um, Vicky, what, 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 as you've gone through this, what would you share with someone? What would you pull uh, to, to, to tell someone else? Oh, well, I can't, I can't help it when I teach science. I just can't help it but get excited about God's power. Um, and uh, my kids will, my students will testify to the fact that I actually warn them that I find this terribly exciting that, that this creation that we look at is just so well organized and it's just god shows his mighty power through this and so i i actually find it quite um i love to share about how good god is and about how good his creation is yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and, it, and it kind of segues naturally into well this is god this is this is this is who you should know about yeah yeah absolutely well thank you fantastic sean for yourself yeah, I think I'll go along the lines for, with what Vicky just said. Um, how to know God. I think oftentimes when we read scripture, we have so many, so many doubts. And I think that's, I think that's normal. And I think that's part of our human condition um, to have doubts and to wrestle with scripture. I think one thing I would take is that there are so many brilliant minds out there. There are so many um, people who are gifted with, you know, talents and skills um, when they work in the fields of science or all of that. So they can actually prove, you know, the existence of God and they actually support scripture. So, so I think when I look at scripture, I can just believe that, you know, that it stands on its own authority. 
And that if I were to wrestle with it, just to be responsible, just to be a responsible Christian and to go out and do research because it's out there. And I think God has gifted these people. I mean, like we have Vicky who works in the science department at Kess. So if we have students who are wrestling with questions and I'm, and I'm pretty sure there are not new questions, just to talk to these people, do your own research, be responsible and just pray that God will open your mind so that you're able to be an effective witness to just whoever. I felt, I felt like it was just the natural opening. In other words, you're saying we have no need to be ashamed uh, as, we, as we share these. I know that's a shameless plug for what we're doing here. This is the name of our program, but yeah, we, the, the, the Bible lets us share it and we can do that and feel that, as you say, I like the way you put that, Sean, it stands on its own um, two feet. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm just looking at our clock now and it looks like our time is just about up for our program today. So just a final word from all of you as, we've, as we now reflect on Job 26 is, I'll give you a, a sentence or two, just to, how would you like to finish today? What would you like to leave us with? And uh, Eunice, I'll start with you and we'll, we'll go around. What would, what would be a final thought? I would say there is no safer place than to be at the center of God's will. When we are at the center of his will, we are protected, we are guarded, and we are shielded because he is mighty. Thank you. Vicky. Um, and moving just straight on from that, that when we can understand that what, when we look to nature, when we just see that this is just the beginning of God's power and it's a free gift available to us, let's just hook into God's power. Thank you. Awesome. Sean. That God is sovereign overall. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, look, let me pray for us and pray over what we've read today. And then we'll, uh, and, then, and then we'll say our goodbyes. Let's just bow our heads now, everyone, and pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for what we've read here in Job 26 today. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of creation. We are, you are the God who is bigger um, than the, the circumstances we find ourselves in. The, you're so big, Lord, that it's hard to understand your greatness and your sovereignty. As we look around, there are things that, are, that make sense to us that we see that you've done, but there are things, Lord, that, that boggle our minds still, and we're reminded of the fact that you are bigger than anything uh, that we are facing, Lord, and you are big enough. Uh, for us to give it to you and place it into your hands. And as we've reflected today, Lord, and as those who have been watching today have reflected, I just pray that, uh, we, that we have taken something away now that we will be able to live with and that will empower us to live this week. And that as we've rightly handled the word today, Lord, and as we've, and as we've been workers who have been handling it, Lord, that we can go out and share this, Lord, and not be ashamed of what we've discovered and let others know. So, Lord, we just leave ourselves in your hands today. We thank you for this time in your word. And we pray all these things today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Vicky, Eunice, Sean, thank you for joining us today. It's been lovely to have you on the panel. To those of you who are watching at home, uh, lovely to have you joining us today. Thank you for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you again next week here on Not Ashamed as we again dig into the word and see what it has to say to us for our lives today. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. I just want to thank you so much for joining us today as we engaged in God's Word. I want to encourage you over the coming week, whether it be in family devotion or personal devotion, or whether you find a friend where you can journey in God's Word together. Use these tools, engage with God's Word, ask the important questions so you can draw closer to Him. And I look forward to seeing you again next Sabbath where we connect in God's Word together.